Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third Women in Data Science Conference in Tel Aviv. <laughs> My name is Shirmey Lador, and I'm a data science leader at Intuit, and we're thrilled to host this one-of-a-kind event once again. You know that the data shows that 35% of you were also here last year. So where are you? Show me who you are. Ooh, great. Welcome back and welcome newcomers. You know, each and every one of you was handpicked by us to make sure the highest level discussions are possible here today. And thank you all for supporting Hostel Neot Aviv. Ticket sales for today all go towards helping this cause. So here, you already did something good today. So WIDS started in 2015 at Stanford, with 400 data scientists gathered to discuss top research and technology around AI. Since then, it has grown to have more than 100,000 participants all over the world in 150 conferences and cities. And the, the goal of this conference is to uh, bring to the state top-notch research and technology around AI. The bonus is it encourages women to speak and share their work and become leaders in this exciting field. So thank you all for coming here today. You are now a part of the global community of weeds. So before we begin, here are some of the comments of the newest members of our community. Thank you for organizing this great event. This event is amazing. You are awesome. And I just really love pandas. Well, great, me too. <laughs> so, let's start today. I have a riddle first. Can anyone tell me what are these numbers we see here? Yes, this is the agenda for today. So we have 30, uh, uh, four 30 minute talks. We have eight 10 minute lightning talks. We have 12 round tables and we have eight great content posters. So I really recommend you to check these all out. And on this stage, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank the 32 amazing speakers who took an active part in making this event what it is. Thank you for raising your hand to share your work. So before we begin, I wanted to share some of my summer adventure in Alaska to give you a little bit of a different perspective of our profession. In Alaska, I got to meet bears, walk on glaciers, meet moose and orcas, and canoe in White River, a true into the wild experience, you can say. And this all got me thinking, can we lead a simpler life? Can it all be more simple? And with that thought in mind, I continued to the main purpose of my visit, the KDD, the annual KDD conference, which took part in Alaska this year. And there, I got to meet a, a great uh, group of people. Within Intuit AI, I had the opportunity to take part in the organization of a workshop in KDD. And there, I got to meet a great group of people, a machine learning experts, which kept on asking, can we build simpler and more transparent machine learning model? Within this group, there were the keynote speakers of our workshop. Some of them were also the keynote speaker of KDD conference itself. And here are a few of them. We have here Patrick Cole from H2O, Rich Karuna from uh, Microsoft Research, and the great professor Cynthia Rudin from Duke University. And within this group, we had really interesting discussion and also in the conference itself on why do we use complex models? Why do we need simpler models? And can simple models be as good as complex models? So when I ask people, why do we use complex models? I get multiple answers. First of all, I mean, this is what we study in the university, right? And that's the easiest path. And because it's trendy, because it's fun, because they're accurate, because they get the job done, right? And also because they're easy to keep proprietary secret. So why am I even talking to you about simpler models? So here's one uh, motivation. This is from the talk of Rich Karuna from Microsoft uh, Research. In this study uh, about intelligible models for healthcare, 
The goal of this study was to build a model to predict the mortality risk from pneumonia, the lung infection. Okay, and they started with building a really simple model, a rule-based model. And the rule-based model learned the following rule, that if a person has asthma, it has lower risk to die from pneumonia, from lung infection. Does this make sense to you? Well, if you think about it, it doesn't, right? But the fact is that this is a true pattern in the data. Because when a person has asthma and it shows pneumonia symptoms, because it's in a higher risk group to die, then the doctor would, be, would give more aggressive treatment and automatically admit the person to the ICU, which would in turn reduce the risk of this person to die. Correlation doesn't apply causation, right? This is the classical case of what we call statistical confounding. When we have a variable, in this case the treatment intensity, which is associated with both the dependent and independent variable, causes spurious association. Now, do we want the model to learn this pattern? What do you think? Well, it depends. That's why it's hard to answer. But if you use the model for the admission decision, if you use the model to decide whether you want to admit the patient or not, this could hurt asthmatic patients. So, the, the key to the discovery of this problem was the fact that we used a rule-based model which is completely transparent. And if a rule-based model learned this pattern from the data, well, a neural network probably will too. So, what other bad patterns are there in the data that a neural network can pick up on? So this is one example to why using black box models for high-stake decision can be dangerous. Let's look at another one. This is a case of a New York Times article where a typographical error in the input to a predictive model led to a person being left in prison for years. The error, the typo, was in the historical feature of this person. And the model being used for the prediction in this case is called Compass. Anyone heard of Compass? Okay, so Compass is a black box model used throughout the US justice system. It, it is a black box model and it used more than 100 of features. And in this case, an error in the input to this model led to a person being left in prison for years. So these two examples show us why using black box model for high stakes decision can be dangerous. The question is, do we really have to? Professor Cynthia Ruding, which we saw in the photo in the beginning, she did a lot of uh, experiments to test this, uh, this problem, whether we actually need to use black box model for decision. And one of the experiments she did was to test the accuracy of this black box model named Compass. What she did, she took a model developed in her lab named Corel's, and compare the accuracy of Corel's to Compass. Corel's produces one-sided decision trees, which are certifiably optimal and sparse. And the resulted model in this case was this. It is so small, it can fit in the bottom of this page. And what this model actually shows, that if you are young and have lots of prior offenses, then you are more likely to be rearrested. Now, this is very simple, simple model. Now, the question is, what is the accuracy of these two models, of Compass and Corel's? Well, it turns out they're just about the same accuracy. And what's even more interesting is, this is it doesn't even matter which machine learning model you use, they all kind of perform the same. From complete black box models like Compass and gradient boosted trees, and a radial basis function kernels, which are complete black boxes, to the extreme of Corel's, which whole model is right there, they all kind of perform the same. Now, there was a huge debate about the algorithmic fairness of Compass, and Galiona, uh, the keynote speaker today, would probably mention this in her talk. But from this, it actually in fact shows that we just don't seem to need Compass at all. So why are we still using it? The point is that perhaps we are using complicated models when we don't really need them. 
Professor Cynthia Rudin shows systematically in her research that we don't really need complex models for many types of problems. Energy grid reliability, financial risk assessment, crime series prediction, healthcare. Now, the answer to this question depends on the data representation, of course. Neural networks are really great when you need a really good data representation in your model. But if your, da your data naturally comes with a uh, the good data representation, then all methods tend to perform the same. Now, if all methods tend to perform the same, then maybe a simple model can also perform the same. Now, you'll probably ask me, but how will I know if a simple model exists for my model, for my problem, which is accurate enough? How do I do that without actually finding this model? Well, Cynthia Rudin tried to answer this question in her study on Rushman curves. In, our, in this study, and I really, really recommend you to read the paper on Rushman curves, it's super interesting. I don't have the time to review all of it, I just give you the gist of it. In this study, she defines the condition under which a simple yet accurate model exists for a certain problem. She also uh, uh, proposes a tool, a diagnostic tool, to find the sweet spot between accuracy and complexity. Now, to understand the gist of it, just Listen to this important definition. The Rashomon set is the true Rashomon set is the set of models with low true loss. If we have the x-axis zero is the different models, and the y-axis is the error of this model, the true loss of this model. And the Rashomon set is all the models which error, the true loss, is below theta. And the condition is that if the true Rashomon set is large, a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. This is basically like a big ocean theory. The bigger the ocean, the higher chances are that a simple function is in there somewhere. The bigger the ocean, the higher the chances are that you will find a big fish. The higher the Rashomon set is, the higher the chances are that you will find a simple function in there somewhere. There are so many good models, so hopefully one of them is also simple. If you need to remember one thing from this talk, which you can take home with you, then remember this. If on your problem, all methods tend to perform the same, then it is uh, maybe due to a large Rashomon set. And if your problem has a large Rashomon set, then it is likely that a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. Now you probably ask me, what kind of simple and powerful model can I use in this case? So here is an example of a few of these. We have GATUM from Rich Karuna's lab, Optimal Sparse Decision Trees from Cynthia Rudin's lab, and Super Sparse Linear Integer Model, also from Cynthia Rudin's lab. And I'll just say a word about GATUM. GATUM is an extension to what we know from the 90s, the generalized additive models from Hasty and Tishirani's work. And the addition here is basically, in addition to contribution of each of the features to the final score, we also get the contribution of interactions between features. And the model uh, is optimized using gradient boosting instead of cubic spline as from the original version, which makes it highly power powerful. And these two changes make the model comparable to gradient boosting and random forest, but also completely interpretable and transparent. Really, really worth to check this one out. And all three of them has available code on GitHub. I recommend you to go and check. So to summarize, Alaska is beautiful. Uh, we need to be careful when using data and black box models for high stake decision. We need to start thinking beyond maximizing performance on test set because the models we develop make decisions that impact people's life. And sometimes data can contain bad patterns and error as we saw. And in many cases, simple can be better than complex. Because in many cases, simple have the same accuracy, but can also allow us to have complete transparency to the model decision making. So I will finish with the great words of the great Isaac Newton. Nature is pleased with simplicity, and nature is no dummy.
Thank you all and enjoy the conference.